Welcome everyone to Leaf Litter's first ever environmental nonprofit panel discussion. I'm Amy Nelson. I'm the editor of Leaf Litter, and um, and we're really honored to have five people, five panelists today, who are representing environmental nonprofits from different parts of the country. I'd like to ask uh, each of you to introduce yourselves. And in doing that introduction, um, I know that all of you must have a really brief elevator pitch. So if you can give your elevator pitch and then also answer one of the following questions, either in one word, what is your why? Why do you work where you work? Or if number two, if the magical grant fairy were to drop a half million dollars in your lap today, what would be the first thing you do with it? So we're gonna kick these introductions off uh, going by alphabetical order and first name. So Amy Armstrong, if we can get us started, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Amy Armstrong. I'm the executive director of the South Carolina Environmental Law Project. Um, and we go by SCALP. And so SCALP provides legal muscle to uh, communities and groups seeking to protect themselves and the quality of their environment from uh, various threats that will degrade or destroy their nat the natural resources um, in those communities. And so we do that by providing um, legal advice and formal legal representation in either challenging harmful projects or um, defending against those kinds of projects. And so, um, that's my elevator pitch. I think I'm gonna answer the question about the half a million dollars. So every nonprofit wants to hear that question and would love to see when half a million dollars lands in your lap. And I think probably the first thing I would do is to in establish an endowment naming um, the donor <laughs> because you definitely wanna recognize the donor. But I would, uh, I think we would, what I would do is um, retain more, hire more lawyers and legal support so that we could um, broaden the impact and the reach of our work. We're South Carolina focused um, and we have three offices throughout the state, but I'd like to have more lawyers and more resources deployed because it seems like the environmental threats are only uh, growing. Thank you, Amy. Um, now I'd like Anthony Allen from Save the Sound to give us your elevator pitch. Thanks, Amy, and, and thanks, Amy. Uh, <laughs> To both of you. So I'm, I'm Anthony Allen. I am the Assistant Director of Ecological Restoration at Save the Sound. Save the Sound is a regional environmental nonprofit. Um, we work across the Long Island Sound region, so that's uh, the whole state of Connecticut, Westchester County, New York City, and uh, the North Shore of Long Island. And we lead on environmental action in the region. That ranges as everything from uh, leading climate advocacy uh, work to doing uh, land preservation work and, and fighting to, to preserve threatened uh, and critical lands, um, watchdogging and, and looking out for the uh, quality of Long Island Sound in its rivers, the water quality, and then also uh, working with nature and natural systems uh, to restore the conditions for thriving. That is the program that I'm part of uh, and representing here today, our ecological restoration team and so we bring a, a vast array of tools uh, to the work that we do, everything from big yellow machines and rivers to, you know, lawyers, similar to Amy, um, you know, uh, working with municipalities to figure out uh, how we can best preserve the quality of our waters. Um, yeah, and you'll see Soundkeeper Bill Lucy out on the water uh, time to time, too. He's part of our organization. He's part of the Riverkeeper Waterkeeper uh, group. So he's out there as well. Oh, and... In one word, what is my why? Um, I, I'm going to say relationship, both because the work that we do is incredibly collaborative. Uh, we've never done a project just by ourselves, um, and we, we lean a lot on our partners, um, and that's something that is a movement we need to do. But also, uh, the relationship between human and natural systems uh, and economic and ecological systems is something that is really important to me. Um, speaks to my, my background, my experiences, and um, I love to think about the, the, the past, present, and future of the way we relate to one another in the natural world. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, and now I'd like Daniel Newberry with the Johnson Creek Watershed Council to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, Daniel Newberry, Johnson Creek Watershed Council, and we're in Portland, Oregon. 
and we restored Johnson Creek with the help of the community. And I think the community part is a, a really big piece of what we do as an organization. We had uh, pre pandemic, at least we were at about 3000 volunteer signups a year and a lot of the volunteer restoration that we coordinate <clears throat> is riparian in nature, helping to plant trees, native shrubs, um, both to uh, increase shade in the riparian areas, uh, but also to uh, reestablish native vegetation. We also have a, a pretty robust uh, volunteer program doing uh, community science, everything from documenting where beaver dams are on the stream to um, looking at prairie nesting birds or recording salmon reds. Um, we also do a lot of in-stream restoration to help um, salmonids, um, everything from removing a dam, which we did last year, to replacing culverts that block fish passage. And um, we're actually now getting into uh, stormwater and uh, green infrastructure retrofits. <clears throat> um, let's see, what would I do with half a million dollars? Um, are you offering? Uh, we would love to be able to uh, purchase some uh, some kind of property for an office space. We've had uh, issues. It's hard to find really good rental space, so our current space is not ideal. So that's that's um, what I would what I would do. Thank you, Daniel. You never know who might hear this and make that offer. So um, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Heather Elmer with Chagrin River Watershed Partners and also representing the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative. Well, thank you, Amy, for hosting this conversation. I'm really excited to be part of this. I'm Heather Elmer, Executive Director of Chagrin River Watershed Partners. We're located here in Northeast Ohio in the Lake Erie Watershed. Uh, Chagrin River Watershed Partners, we are working to, to achieve healthy watersheds that support vibrant communities. And to do that, we really work on connecting people uh, to protect and restore streams and wetlands, protecting our stream corridors and natural areas. We also do a lot of work to enhance parks and enhance resilience to storms. Uh, we do that through local and regional planning, and we also have a suite of model watershed protection ordinances that we've developed and, and work with communities to adopt. Uh, and in addition to working on, on all of those efforts with our members, we also work with partner watershed organizations in the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative. And that's a network of organizations here throughout Northern Ohio, uh, where we're really we're working together and trying to share our resources uh, to accelerate progress toward protecting and restoring watersheds throughout our region uh, and improving water quality in Lake Erie. And, I, I think I'll take the uh, what is my why question. And um, my why is Lake Erie uh, with millions of other people uh, in our region. I drink the water, swim in it, eat fish from it. And, you know, we really just are our watersheds and in our part of the world, our Great Lakes. So that's my why. Love it. Thank you. We are our watersheds indeed. Um, Sarah Noss with the Santa Fe, Santa Fe Conservation Trust. If you could introduce yourself, Sarah. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Noss. I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Conservation Trust, which serves basically northern New Mexico. Um, we have kind of a three-part mission to our work. We protect significant landscapes. Uh, we also have a big trails legacy. We've been involved in the creation of about 75 miles of trails in and around Santa Fe. And we also protect the night sky. Um, so as a 28 year old land trust, we um, have primarily you know, worked on land conservation, but we're realizing more and more that we need to reach out to the community as much as we can and diversify our work bring more equity and inclusion into our work um, to really, you know, ignite a passion for nature in people um, because we need to start developing the next generation of conservationists who are gonna carry all this work forward. Um, and I'd say for our, the $500,000 question, um, we're a 28 year old land trust and um, we've primarily worked with landowners who can afford to donate their development rights to us. Um, 
if we're going to have a larger landscape scale impact on our region to protect more connected corridors for wildlife and biodiversity protection, we're going to need to work with a wider diversity of landowners. And um, we need that 500,000 to start an endowment here that's going to allow us to work with a wider diversity of landowners. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, and, and thank you all for your introductions. Anthony, um, a moment ago, you, you, know, you mentioned your, your why being relationships. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about partnerships, and I know that partnerships are essential to the work that all of you do. Um, and I'm curious to know, Anthony, we'll start with you. you know, what makes an effective partnership and what do you look for in a partner? Yeah, so I mean, it is it is such a huge part. I know for all of us in in the work that we do, uh, Save the Sound certainly not unique in in that respect. <clears throat> I will say that uh, the range and the diversity of the types of partners that we work with is pretty is pretty extraordinary. Um, and, you know, even just on our on our ecological restoration team, right? We are working with some partners who uh, bring technical capabilities to a project. Right, we consider the folks that we contract with on on everything from living shorelines projects to dam removals to green infrastructure. Um, we consider them our our partners, uh, biohabitats being one, um, and uh, they're they're really really important um, to our process. And having the trust uh, built in those relationships is is really critical too. It, it allows us to really um, work effectively and and change course when needed. Um, I think we all know that when you get into a project, um, you never really know what you're going to hit or come up against until you're, you're digging in the dirt and, and uh, you know, taking the dam out. Uh, right. And so there's, there's a lot that can come up. And so having trust in your partners is really, really important. Um, I think there's a whole range of other partners though, that is, you know, connected to the community. We always, always look uh, to do projects and prioritize projects where it was brought to us by a community group or, or a community organization, or otherwise we have uh, strong ties there, or at least some relationships, um, because uh, you know that in and of itself is perhaps the hardest thing for a regional organization to do is to just come into a community and, and start working on a on a large scale project without having uh, again, the trust and those relationships built there um, with the folks in that community that are going to be impacted. So uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into, into these partnerships and these relationships, but uh, ultimately there's, there's a broad array of them that, that come together to make uh, these complex projects possible and uh, successful, not just in restoring the, the landscape, but also in building greater connection between uh, the folks that live there and different environmental groups so just a quick follow-up um so you talked about trust both when working with uh, maybe private firms like biohabitats but also within communities um how do you uh what have you been what have you found to be an effective way of earning that trust um within the communities that you you serve yeah that's a great question so Part of it, right, is is to not come in uh, with with all the answers and just start telling folks how it's going to go down. Um, I think when when we come into a process, a lot of times the, like I said, a lot of times the community is reaching out to us um, and asking us to get involved with the project. Um, but even when they're not, um, we look to to listen first and to have those conversations, um, and then to to actually include uh, different community groups as partners in the grants and the things that we write um, so that it's not just, you know, here's draw a box around the, the technical requirements of getting this project done and that's the grant. No, it's, it's, it's taking a larger view of what does the impact of this project look like and how do we put together uh, an array of partners that can actually take into account and secure that, that broader sort of impact that's not just on the landscape, but but also sort of how that landscape interacts with the community and vice versa. Thank you. Um, how about you, Heather? 
Anything to add on, you know, what makes a good partnership and what you look for in a partner? Yeah, partners are just absolutely essential and intrinsic to our work. I, you know, partnership, the, the word is even included in our name. Uh, we work with over 100 partners on a regular basis, you know, everything from our member communities and park districts to watershed partners um, throughout the collaborative. We also work with stormwater utilities and other conservation groups and, and private entities. And I found that in in situations where you may have a uh, long term partnership initiatives and coalitions like the collaborative, it's really helpful to have a set of guiding principles for how you work together. Uh, so for the collaborative, you know, we've set some out, out some of those principles, including that we really can achieve more um, working together than on our own. Uh, we all participate by choice and retain our autonomy. Um, we work to maintain transparency. Uh, and communication, which I really think, uh, you know, gets to uh, the trust issue that Anthony uh, was bringing up. And so I, I feel like uh, those those types of principles can really be um, helpful in kind of uh, forming a foundation for that long term uh, work together. And in the collaborative, I think, you know, we've seen partnerships uh, really manifest in many different ways. We have some groups that are providing technical and administrative support for others. Uh, some are serving as fiscal agents. Um, others have developed new programs that benefit our entire region, like a new AmeriCorps program uh, called the Northern Ohio Watershed Corps that was developed uh, by Tinkers Creek Watershed Partners, uh, but that a lot of members of our collaborative network uh, participate in. And so that's really expanded the capacity um, and support for all the on the ground work that that watershed uh, organizations across our region do. Also, I feel like partnerships can really be important. You know, if you have kind of a large scale project uh, in our area, that's uh, delisting the Cuyahoga River uh, as a Great Lakes area of concern. And we've seen recently uh, um, many members of our network come together, work together, each bringing their own strengths, whether it be in education or community engagement or restoration work uh, to most efficiently. Uh, restore the Cuyahoga River and uh, remove it uh, from the, the current list of Great Lakes areas of concern. Uh, so, so yeah, just in a, in a word, partnerships are absolutely uh, key to everything we do. Heather, in uh, kind of es establishing those guiding mm -hmm. principles, is that something you knew to do right off the bat or were there some bumps in the road that helped you realize, wait a minute, we need some guiding principles. As you know, as this network developed, this is going back to about uh, 2014, there was a local foundation, the George Gund Foundation, uh, that uh, was very interested in seeing watershed organizations coordinate their efforts and work together. And so they made a grant uh, for groups to explore how we might be able to do that. And we enlisted the support of the Institute for Conservation Leadership uh, to help us navigate uh, that process. And the facilitator that we worked with um, there uh, at ICL uh, you know, is still with us today and has really helped us uh, kind of uh, ensure that the network is uh, robust and uh, evolving in a way that's positive for, for everyone that's participating. And I believe that facilitator early uh, in the game said, you know, this is growing and changing over time. Uh, we were starting to receive some grant funding that would be uh, intended for the whole network and to allow us to serve one another. And he suggested that we could really benefit from kind of having uh, that framework in place. So it was really through working with him. I like this thread a conversation and I and I also recognize that we have you know Heather and Daniel and and others who who work at a watershed scale um, and one of the things that I've noticed and we've noticed in our work and, and appreciate about it is that when you work at a watershed scale you're working along the boundaries of natural systems and not human community and so uh, like in Connecticut right there's 169 towns in Connecticut uh, and any given watershed crosses a lot of those boundaries. And so we're working with different communities who may have different relationships with one another, very different populations, level of income, all these things, um, different land cover. So uh, to Daniel or Heather, you know, I'd, I'd love to know, sort of hear a little bit about your experience 
um, working at the scale of a watershed, how you how you think about community on a given project and how you define that community that you're that you're working with. Um, I'll jump in. I'd say you know one of the um, the biggest challenges since we our, our population is is mixed in in the upper part of our watershed. It's very agricultural, and in the lower part of the watershed, it's extremely urban. <clears throat> and one of the challenges we've worked with, and we we still don't have the answer to, and that that has to do with how to how to kind of have these different populations um, involve them in sort of the work of the other part of the watershed. And part of that too, there's a there's a certain travel time that gets in the way sometimes, right? You know, if you have a meeting here, everyone who lives way over here may not want to do the driving. It's hard to get people interested. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some heads nodding. I'm, I know I'm not the only one who's run into this, but you know, if there's anything good that's come out of the pandemic, I think it's that, you know, meetings like we're having right now <clears throat> are probably going to make it a lot easier for people geographically dispersed to participate in meetings. So we're looking forward to seeing how we can use this technology to solve what has been a real challenge for us. And I would just add a, a seconding Daniel's comment on the virtual uh, meeting capacity, making it easier to, you know, bridge uh, some of those, you know, what could be uh, fairly large geographic barriers and in, in some of the watersheds that we work in. Um, also, I think, you know, for us, we were actually founded by uh, some of the communities within our watershed, and they comprise our board of directors, and that has since grown um, to include over 90 percent of the uh, municipalities and townships and counties, park districts uh, in our watershed. So they form our board of directors and the fact that they come together regularly for meetings and uh, hear about, you know, watershed issues uh, in that context that goes beyond their, their borders, I think does uh, help to um, create that more uh, ecological scale uh, mindset. And we've seen, you know, upstream communities being willing to do things like adopt riparian setback ordinances, not just because that may benefit, you know, landowners within their boundaries, but they also know that it might help communities uh, downstream. So it sounds like um, both involvement of of your organizations, you know, vast membership, um, different neighborhoods on the board, and also taking advantage of um, the tools that we've now gotten. Also, we've all gotten much better at using to meet virtually are helpful in that area. Um, continuing along the theme of partnerships, uh, how do you, how can those folks in the private sector be better partners in your organization? So the, the private firms that do ecological restoration and conservation, but also businesses. Um, Amy, can you talk to us about that? Share your thoughts on? Yeah, I'm glad to, and thanks for asking. I think it's a, a good question. Um, and I think one of the first things that any you know, business can do that's interested in the work that the nonprofits are doing in their communities is to engage with them and just learn about what they're doing and make sure that they're, you know, or they're aware of the, the work that's going on. And I, I say that because I have had experience with, with um, partners, business partners that receive our e-news, find out about an issue, and then you ask how they can help. And so that, you know, that's the very, very, very simple thing that um, business uh, potential partners can do. Um, you know, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the value to nonprofits and having the financial support from the business community. And this, this year is the first year that the Environmental Law Project has um, initiated a, a more formalized business partnership where there's a year long relationship where there's financial support, but there's also co-branding and marketing opportunities. And out of that, just even having that kind of a relationship, we have, you know, especially with, you know, biohabitats is a good example because um, we've used biohabitats uh, to help us with specific projects doing, uh, retaining the firm or in, in potential partners, having that relationship already where you can retain them to do 
you know, work when you've got a larger project, but then also having a relationship where if you just need, you know, the quick, quick turnaround or advice um, or consulting on a, on a project that you're working on can be really valuable just to have like a go-to um, where there are also opportunities for pro bono work. And so, um, you know, both in both of those ways, it's just help. It's very valuable to develop those business relationships where you've got, you know, I've heard the, the, again, the word relationship coming up and, and establishing those relationships between nonprofit partners and the business community um, is really, you know, is really, really valuable to, um, to helping us do our work and hopefully um, providing opportunities for, for um, businesses to engage with the nonprofit community. So I, I think um, you know, those are the main ways that we, um, we see and I think are, are, it's, are becoming increasingly important as, as we see the environmental issues and threats that we're facing are becoming more complex and um, are becoming more um, sophisticated. And so we need to keep up with that. And really there are resources um, in the, that the business community can provide and that we hope that we're able to you know, access and also um, provide our, our expertise where, where needed. So I think that there are, there are great potential. Um, again, I just love the words relationships and partnerships because I, I think that they're really um, capturing some of the dynamic that I hope comes out of this is coming out of this conversation. So it sounds like my Claudia Brown has uh, has joined us. Claudia is a uh, senior ecologist and water resources specialist for biohabitats, and Claudia heads up all of uh, biohabitats work on the western half of the country, and. Um, is gonna co-facilitate the rest of the discussion with me. So welcome, Claudia. Um, but I, I did wanna follow up, Amy. It, it sounds like, um, I think a lot of times, uh, folks in the private sector maybe get contacted once a year when the annual fundraiser is coming around for a sponsorship or something like that. But you're finding that these sort of longer term partnerships are more meaningful um, and more productive really to, for, for both parties. And um, am I, accurately capturing. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't, it's thinking of it as a one, once a year, one time a year thing, I, I think undervalues the, um, the relationship. And I, first, it's important for us to give you know, recognition, especially to businesses that are mission aligned and that have the same goals. And so it's, I think it's very important to recognize that throughout the year and to be able to not just think of, hey, sponsor this one event, but let's be, you know, let's be a partner in this and come to the event, but also let's think about other ways that we can, you know, work together throughout the year. And so I, um, I mean, it's, it's a shift for us this year. And so we're, we're, we're trying it out. Um, but just you know, part of it is just because we have a, a lot, a great appreciation for, for the business community and recognize that it's a very valuable role um, that, you know, all that they, they play in supporting the nonprofit community. Uh, so yes, I, I hope that that is something that is used more and we're looking forward to establishing those even more as we go forward. We started this discussion of partnerships, the, the word community came up and, and, you know, Sarah, you talked about igniting a passion for, for nature in the work that you do. Um, and I do want to kind of shift to community engagement. And I know Claudia is sort of going to pick up facilitation of this section of the, the discussion, but Sarah, what does effective engagement look like to you? And, you know, what strategies and techniques have you guys found that are effective in, in igniting that passion and getting folks involved in your work? Um, well, I, I guess I'll just kind of preface my answer by by saying that environmental groups, just as um, the whole part of the charitable or charitable pie, environmental groups get about three percent of it, and they have to share it with animal rights groups. So we're already pretty challenged in terms of the amount of charitable funding that comes our way, um, and so. Knowing that, um, you know, we've kind of moved forward with this re realization that if we're not relevant to our community, 
we're going to be stuck in that um, splitting 3% of the charitable pie with environmental groups or, or animal rights groups. Um, and so in New Mexico, we're a very poor state. Um, we don't have a lot of the corporations are down in Albuquerque. They don't focus where we are in northern New Mexico so much. Um, and so to us, it's become really important to this igniting a passion for nature in people and making ourselves more relevant to the community is just key to our really financial survival. Um, a couple of things, uh, like right now, we have a, a dark sky program, which is protecting the night sky. We require all our landowners on over 40,000 acres in northern New Mexico to have um, low impact lighting. So big deal. But right now, the city of Santa Fe is thinking about changing out their uh, entire street light system. And they are currently kind of going down the wrong path because um, they want to put really high Kelvin uh, blue spectrum lights in their uh, street lights. Um, and nighttime lighting, you know, disrupts wildlife, mating, the circadian rhythm of people, hormones, uh, gestational periods kind of increases all sorts of health uh, problems. And so suddenly we are kind of in the middle of a relevant um, discussion citywide about this lighting program. Um, but, um, and, you know, are able to talk about uh, the disappearance of the night sky means that you can't see what our, the Anasazi saw. Um, so that's been a really great thing to just bring attention and hopefully more compassion for what we're trying to do. Um, there are also, you know, we're realizing around our trails program that um, older people really don't have access to nature, especially if they're in wheelchairs or on walkers. Um, and so we started an in-town walking program, um, which is weird. It's like, why did we do that? Well, from this 3% pie, um, we can expand the pie to healthcare. Um, certainly walking improves health. Um, we can uh, expand it out to getting city funding to help you know, lower the overall health care costs for our city. And um, we've in two years, we've had about 800 people take walks in town with us. So um, community engagement, we are finding not only brings in more funding to help us advance our mission, but it's also really the right thing to do. It helps people get out in nature. It connects them to nature, creates more interest in our work and uh, has just become a really important part of what we do. Uh, I wanted to to follow up on something you said, Sarah, about, um, and it kind of goes back to what Amy said about relationships. So um, of these 800 people and the different people you're reaching out to, how many of them are repeat or do you feel like there's continuity with, or, or do you have a core group of stakeholders or community people that you're connecting with again and again? Because I feel like that continuity is really important. Yeah. Um Definitely, we we formed a collaborative called the Santa Fe Walking Collaborative. It includes AARP, the City of Santa Fe, New Mexico Department of Health, um, La Familia Medical Center. You know, it's a whole bunch of uh, groups, big brothers, big sisters, who are interested in trying to get their constituents outside and moving. So we all kind of leverage our you know, marketing to our constituents. And um, it turned out that, yeah, there were a lot of people who walked with us. Basically, when we started, it was seven walks a month from May through October. So we gave a lot of options. Um, now it's kind of, we kind of made it a little bit smaller, five walks a month, May through October. And we have a Saturday walk to make it easier for uh, families to come and join us. But yeah, there were a lot of people who showed up um, for many of the walks and uh, and then word of mouth seemed to bring other people in. Well, I guess I was also say, asking then, so that now with the Dark Sky Initiative, are those people you can go to and say like, hey, you know, can you sign this letter? Because we really want to increase awareness around dark sky issues. Is it a reciprocal relationship where you're not just giving the walks, but there's participating in conversations and and advocacy work? 
Definitely. We've found that people who go on the walk then show up at fundraisers, people who um, uh, get on our mailing list, you know, become yeah. more uh, excited to advocate for yeah. whatever issue is up for us. Do, doing something together and having ongoing conversations, because I wanted to comment on something Amy said, you know, like when when you're actually helping a lot of the businesses, if you offer opportunities like this, because <clears throat> like we have 1% for the planet commitment, we need to find people to give to and to do things and to do pro bono work for, you know, like we, it's a part of our annual commitment. And I could really see that being more meaningful if in the beginning of each year, there was a conversation about like, what are your priorities this year? What do you have time for? What do you think you can help? And like having like mini, you know, uh, stewardship plans with your donors, I think would really help it all be, be more um, rich. Like if what, what Sarah was saying, like if you were saying like, we really want to get the dark sky message out, then like we could tell Amy, oh, Amy, can you put dark sky issue in the newsletter? And like, it all starts to sing because it's a conversation. And it goes back to what Anthony said about transparency and trust, because there's a really good book called um, At the Speed of Trust. Have you guys heard about that? But where you just lay your stuff out on the table and you just say, like, this is what I really want to work on this year. And what do you want to work on? And it's it it helps it helps everybody help each other, I guess, is what I hear. So I guess that really gets to um, Daniel's um, uh, talking about an issue that's on all our minds lately, which is equity and engagement and, and um, you know, a, a part where we've all struggled with uh, building trust is in some of the disadvantaged communities because we come in as these, you know, we're all white here. I, I don't know everybody's ethnicity, but, you know, we, we come from a, uh, an advantaged uh, uh, place, most of us, and, and um, we have this passion and love and we want to share it, but we aren't necessarily always um, adept in how to make that balanced and and we're all learning now and it's a beautiful time and and a lot of opportunity but there's also a lot of ways to to step on our own toes and other people's toes so i think daniel if you could talk about what is your inclusion and equity and um, environmental justice work look like and how have you had success with that and how are you weaving it into your work i think we'd all have a lot to learn from that oh thank you claudia Yes, yeah, so uh, in terms of the state of Oregon, we have probably um, about the most uh, diverse watershed in terms of population, ethnicity, race. <clears throat> and you know, a few years ago, when we looked at who was coming to our volunteer events, those that group was not representative of the demographics of the watershed. And it got us thinking and also thinking about, well, who benefits from our, our services? And we've, uh, four years ago, we put together a, an equity action plan to try and address some of these. And I think we we really look at this as, as kind of uh, a two-pronged thing. One is um, who benefits from our services? And the other is, what's our organization like? Is it a welcoming and inclusive type of organization that people are gonna wanna do things with? And so there are really two things that we feel that it were important to work on those two things all at the same time. Um, and, you know, one of the things this has really led to is, is uh, a change in focus somewhat of what we do as an organization. Uh, when we look at who benefits, one of the things we found from talking to some of our community, community partner organizations run by non non white uh, boards and staffs is that uh, they don't always feel safe in the green spaces. And I think that's one thing that's been clear all across the country in the last year in light of what happened with George Floyd, those kinds of conversations started opening up more. And so we're looking more at creating programs for a diverse community in some of the green spaces, um, especially uh, programs where people can come back over and over again so that people who traditionally have not had that opportunity to develop a relationship with one particular park, one particular open space, can come back time and time again. And they can then, based on their experience within their own communities, talk about their experience and help bring more people into those spaces. So that's definitely one of the approaches we've used. Um, we've also found that building relationships with these community organizations is really the key to reaching more diverse um, 
more diverse uh, audience because they have the trust of different segments of the community that we have not worked with. And that's how you build trust, really that organization to organization partnership. And what we found is that the probably the best success we've had is a, a multi-year project where at the beginning we recognized a need and before we had started planning the project, we went out, we figured out who the partners were, we invited them. So everybody got involved at the ground level in designing it. It wasn't like we said, oh, here's a cool project we've developed. Hey, you want to sign on? You want to do a letter of support for a grant or whatever? You know, it's like you get included from ground zero um, and we all work together. And, and that project is almost in its third year now and it's, it's going really well. That's super interesting. Um, I also wanted to circle back to something you said about your watershed diversity in terms of rural and urban, because I've worked on a lot of watersheds at that scale also with a similar diversity. And one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes the rural inclusion is kind of left out. And I, I do think that that's an area that all of us can think about of that economic divide and the, um, and the kind of cultural divide and red blue divide, you know, it's not just it's not just diversity in terms of, um, you know, uh, um, ethnicity, but I think uh, politically we've got some, you know, there's a lot more work that can be done in, in um, thinking outside the box there and not having it be so um, divided. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think we were gonna go into fundraising and maybe that's, uh, um, oh, Denise isn't here, so we're gonna skip that. So, um, uh, that this kind of brings us back to Amy and communication about advocacy. I mean, I th and th something you said also um, about what are the benefits. I think one of the places that we can bridge the divide is on shared values and and what are the benefits that we all have and um, and that's something that we found in these rural um, urban watersheds that we could come together around. There's a lot of hunters and fishermen that love the waterways and you know want to protect them and be a part of having their kids enjoy them or their grandkids and want access just like everybody else. Um, so I guess Amy, are there so a part of one of the most important uh, uh, ways to to bridge this gap is through communication. And how do you communicate values in a way that everybody can relate to and doesn't feel, you know, that it's um, uh, uh, adversarial? Um, so, Amy, I think we were going to talk about, like, what important communication advocacy work have you been able to do as part of your coalition that's been efficient and effective about bringing people together around a shared topic? Sure. And I think I think I should just start by saying, like, none none of us can do this work on our own. I mean, we just, we, we need, we just don't have the capacity to do everything that needs to be done by ourselves. And so uh, we have, it, we're participating in a lot of different um, coalitions. Uh, the one of them that comes to mind that I think is most, is really um, a good um, sort of a collective voice is called the South Carolina Conservation Coalition. Um, it's a group of about 40 different environmental nonprofits throughout the state. And some of them have a budget of zero and some of them are multi-million dollar nonprofits. So we're across, you know, really across the board and every one of those organizations has a voice in a vote um, that they go towards deciding what the legislative priorities are going to be for the coalition for that year. And so we do it in a very democratic process and then we can pool our resources. So we have, because there are so many different groups participating, you have different um, you know, leverage points, different relationships with legislators, different, um, you know, some groups have lobbyists, some don't. And so we're able, we can be much more effective in communications because we are using the collective um, knowledge, expertise, relationships of of the groups that we that we are um, you know working with, so that we um, have a uh, we develop messaging out of those priorities, and so there's um, a key set of talking points we share and disseminate among the groups, so that we all 
are speaking from the same page, that we are communicating using the same language, um, so that we're using that, uh, the, 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 I mean, it's the same language, I guess, is, is really the, the key so that we're making sure that it's understandable, simple, you know, we're all speaking from the same sheet and so that it, it, across many, many organizations, we can have, we can extend the reach of our impact and have much more collective in, impact in, in how we communicate. And so it certainly takes, it takes some coordination and work to do all of that, to make sure that you are um, using the same language and, and um, on the same page. But I think it's been very effective in, in our state of being able to advance certainly legislative priorities. Um, it's also been really um, valuable to you know, learn from from other you know other partners and other groups that we we're working with. We're we're also part of this um, the Donnelly Foundation, which has a a partnership of environmental groups that are working on specifically on land conservation. And so recognizing that again we can leverage each other's knowledge and expertise because there are some land trusts, there's some ad advocacy groups, there's some you know law law groups, and that we. Um, all are able to bring something to the table, and that helps us in, in our collective um, in our collective efforts. And so, I think, um, yeah, and I think that, of course, we also realized that you know while we're we're lawyers and we're in the in the courtroom a, a lot, that a, an important component is communicating what's what is the what is the threat, what's the what's at risk, what's at stake, and having the public be able to understand that and weigh into the decision-making process. So trying to use those communication modalities more effectively to, you know, recognizing that it doesn't all happen just by advocacy, just by our legal work. And, um, there's a broader effort. I mean, I think getting to your point which was a, an interesting one about the divides that we have and trying to find more areas where there are commonalities um, certainly South Carolina is a pretty red state, but we have in some of the reddest parts of our state, really in Horry County, there have been uh, more people becoming aware that because they're seeing what's happening with flooding, when you are filling in wetlands adjacent to the, you know, in those watersheds and areas that, 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 that's a serious threat. And so there's a growing awareness and thinking about how we can, um, working on communicating around that is, I think, a growing you know, area and um, something that we've been excited to see, at least some some, some changes, I think, that are happening. Yeah. We okay. Thank you, Amy. If we could all, um, if everyone could mute themselves just for a second, we were getting a little bit of feedback. Um, I feel like we could talk for hours and hours on each one of the topics that we addressed here, um, but we are getting close to running out of time. And I did have one more question that I wanted to ask, um, which was, you know, more or more of a visioning, like looking into the crystal ball, you know, five to 10 years from now, what does the environmental movement look like? And what is the role for organizations like yours in that vision? Um, how about Anthony? What, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, more more probably than we have time for. Um, <laughs> so you know, there's there's a lot to be done here because, um, as we know, the the audience that engages with uh, environmental issues um, is really varied and comes to the work and comes to this topic in this area um, from any number of different of different routes and lived experiences. Um, so as far as like where the movement is heading and where I hope it's heading is um, is sort of movement that's, that's a lot more intersectional, um, recognizing that environmental action um, can only go so far absent uh, uh, social justice action, absent racial justice action. Uh, you can't build the coalition 
and the group, the, the movement of movement, so to speak, that we need uh, to tackle the, the level of change and the level of, of, uh, of work ahead of us um, if we just look at the environmental issues and the environmental uh, aspects of it. And so it goes uh, well beyond sort of the work that we know has to be done at the landscape level. Um, and it goes to an economic level, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very uh, interested in, and uh, would advocate for a complete reform of the way that, <laughs> that our funding system uh, works, uh, you know, for, for nonprofits in particular, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, expectation and sort of uh, limited resources. Um, and, uh, you know, so for, from our perspective, for instance, Save the Sound, uh, one of the things that our ecological restoration team, which 10 years ago was one person um, and now is, uh, you know, I think seven at the moment um, and doing a dozen projects at any given time, uh, which makes us, sadly, I guess, one of the, the larger ecological restoration programs in the area. Um, one of the things that we're moving toward is capacity building uh, and taking on that that new role or more of a role in working with smaller organizations, grassroots organizations, um, you know, who are maybe tangentially related in their mission to the environment and looking at uh, ways that we can, we can work with them so that uh, the more funding we see coming down the, the path in terms of uh, looking at nature-based solutions as the first place to go when we look at uh, infrastructure issues and things like that uh, and resiliency, um, where that funding comes down, it doesn't doesn't just you know come through, execute projects, and and leave. That uh, it actually addresses uh, some of these other related and, and intersecting issues um, that are core to actually making this movement and the impact that we're seeking um, sustainable. Uh, so those are those are just a few of the <laughs> a few of the, the thoughts. But I'd love to hear from others too. Yeah, so you talked about a, a dissolving of, of those funding boundaries and, you know, de-siloizing of, of this, this work, I think, is um, a really beautiful vision. Uh, does anyone have anything to add? Um, I was just going to add that, you know, uh, for us at a land trust, um, we're taking the 30 by 30 nationwide initiative very seriously. Uh, we've got nine years to put 30% of the land and 30% of the oceans, um, you know, under protection. And nationwide, I think, I think we're at, you know, maybe 15%. And uh, it's going to take private landowners to make that happen. And uh, so again, going back to diversity, equity, and inclusion, there are a lot of landowners that can't participate in land conservation. It's just very expensive. And um, so, you know, 10 years down the road, I'd like to see, um, you know, the federal government helping cover transaction costs. I'd like to see people help land trusts cover transaction costs for uh, a diversity of landowners to participate in this effort. And it is gonna take, it's gonna take that kind of effort. Um, and hopefully 10 years down the road, you know, we'll be really close to that. I just think the whole climate crisis, the extinction crisis, the threat to biodiversity that we're seeing is gonna demand it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, I'm so sorry that we have to wrap this discussion up. Um, it's been great to, to talk to all of you. And um, who knows, I, I would really like to try to do this or something like this again. Um, I'm grateful that you chose to, to share your insight and wisdom with, with me and Claudia and with all the Leaf Litter readers. Um, so thank you all so much. And Amy, can I add one more thing? I think Daniel and Heather and, and Amy, if they had other things to add to the vision for five, you know, in 10 years, maybe they could email and add it in to the written version of this. Because I think uh, it is, it's like unrequited uh, conversation. <laughs> There's so much more you guys could say. Yeah. Love to hear it. Yeah, if you want to stay on the call and share that, uh, any more thoughts with us, that's fine. I just don't want to keep anyone longer than we we asked you for. I, I think I'll jump in then on this last question that Anthony and Sarah were talking about. Um, that is looking forward. 
I think responding to the climate crisis we have in this planet is going to be really key for a couple reasons. One of which is it's something that affects us all. So it's something that can really unify people. But the other thing is that it affects um, poorer and other underserved communities a lot more than it really affects mainstream communities, not only in this country, but around the world. So that if we really want to also make progress on environmental justice, I think looking at the climate crisis is one way that's going to help us unify these two things together. Thank you, Daniel. Would anyone else like to add on to the conversation here? or ask any questions of each other. Just jumping off Anthony's uh, comments around, you know, the intersectionality and, you know, needing to kind of break down some of those barriers to really, uh, you know, further uh, the work that we're doing on the environmental front. I think we've been seeing with some funders, uh, they've been expressing a willingness to invest in uh, community engagement that we might work that we might be doing to enhance equity. So they, I think they recognize uh, that this is really a process of listening and trust and relationship building, you know, finding opportunities uh, to work with communities and really hear from them on, you know, what what do they see as the problems and, and the solutions, have them be part of, of that rather than, you know, coming in with a predefined uh, agenda and that that, you know, that takes time uh, and that, you know, really it requires uh, resources and so you know i'm hopeful that uh with support from our partners and and other key funders we'll be able to move in that direction in the future thank you heather would anyone else like to share anything before we close out i'll share a quote to close this i guess uh this is uh it's from nonprofit af uh, and one of our, our team members just, just shared this around to several of us this morning. Um, and so I, or, or yesterday, excuse me. Um, and it's about equity. And he, he says, uh, for equity, be, for equity to be realized, it must be constantly and consistently integrated. It must constantly and consistently be integrated into everything we do and think about. Equity can't be like pine nuts which we only add to certain dishes when we want to impress our friends and can spare $17 for eight pine nuts. It must be like our favorite knife, which we use every day to prepare ingredients for all sorts of dishes, and thus it must always be kept sharp. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is great. And I, I really wish that we could talk more deeply about a lot of these topics, and I hope we can sometime in the future. Thank you all so much. Be well, and thanks for all the amazing work that you do.